Good afternoon, as it were. My name is Jason Hanford. I'm an attorney at the Chartwell Law Offices. Uh, we are here today to present what is the third in our five or six or I don't know how many entry series on Pennsylvania workers' compensation. It's an overview of Pennsylvania workers' compensation. We won't call it an intro, but it's, it's really a, the, the 50,000 foot view of what goes on in Pennsylvania workers' compensation claims. We've already covered, for those of you who may have been with us, we covered Pennsylvania Workers' Compensation Bureau forms, Office of Adjudication forms. That was our first seminar. The last one, we handled course and scope. We spent an hour telling interesting stories about course and scope issues. And today we're gonna to be talking about claims, claim petitions. You know, what, what, how are we gonna, what, what do you need to prove to have a claim petition granted? And what are some of the defenses you can present in the hopes of not having a claim presented, petition granted? Uh, again, my name is Jason. I am essentially your tour guide for these presentations. I'll be with you in each one. My job, because it's the one thing I may be good at in life, is to ask dumb questions and, and to read the better questions that you all might have. And on that topic, if you look at the bottom of your screen right now, uh, assuming you have a similar screen to me, you'll see a Q&A section. There's a chat section and a Q&A section. If you have questions throughout the presentation, we want to know your questions, put them in the Q&A section. I will track that. I will try to get to your questions as we go. If there's a question that doesn't really fit about what we're talking about, I'll make sure to circle back around to it. If you have a question you don't want me to cover in front of everybody in a recorded seminar, you can certainly email one of us after the presentation. Our email will be provided, I believe, in the, the follow-up email that you get when we're done. Uh, the one disclaimer I have to give that I always have to give for these seminars is that we're providing a legal overview today. We're not providing specific legal advice. We do provide specific legal advice and we'd love to do that, but that has to be in a one-on-one -on -one situation where we're serving as your counsel. Uh, to the extent that you hear something clever that we say today and you think it solves something in your case, please don't go make rushed decisions based on what seems like a smart comment from Alex. I'm sure he's right, but make sure you talk it over with your counsel, hopefully in the situation where your counsel is Chartwell. Uh, let me introduce first my panelists today uh, from Western Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area. We have Chartwell partner, Mike Sherman. I think anybody partic participating today who has claims in Western Pennsylvania probably already knows Mike. In addition to being a, a fantastic lawyer, uh, Mike's a really good resource for me, selfishly. <laughs> um, when, when I, before I undertake a research uh, that I need to do because I'm too dumb to know the answer, Mike will tell you, I, I, I email him the question because he's, he, knows the, he knows the case law better than anybody else I know. So he, he's a wonderful resource for us at Chartwell. He's a great attorney for our clients and, and I'm, I'm glad to have him. I don't think I've had you on, Mike. Can you, can you say hi to everybody? Hello, I accept those accolades, humbly. <laughs> and then from the other, the other part of the state, we have uh, attorney Alex Kwasny. Alex has been with the Chartwell for a long time. He's a partner in the Philadelphia office. Uh, everybody likes Alex, including myself. I get, I get great feedback from clients, uh, our shared clients. So I, I can attest to that. Uh, he, does a, he does a great job that I've seen with these speaking engagements. Uh, he's, he's a good, sometimes people are good lawyers, but they're not good explainers. And I, and I think Alex is a pretty good explainer. So, uh, and also Alex, I, I didn't tell you this, but I believe at one point you told me you spent time as a lumberjack. Is, is that accurate? Am I remembering correctly? It, it might have that been. That is a, correct. <laughs> okay. It was, it was in the great state of Iowa, mostly on the eastern side, working for the Iowa State Parks. Uh, it was a nice uh, six to eight week experience I had doing that. So it's so been, Alex it's been helping me in my backyard for my feet now. And yeah. he will take lumberjack questions, logging questions in the Q&A, if indeed the, the comp material gets boring, but it's not going to be boring. So let's get to what we're doing. Uh, the, 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 the initial overview uh, framing the question is this. Pennsylvania workers' compensation claims to simplify and set aside a couple uh, speci special circumstances, you essentially as a claimant can get medical benefits and wage loss benefits. In order to get medical and wage loss benefits, you have to have a compensable workers' compensation claim. How do you get a compensable workers' compensation claim? I'll present to you, there's really two ways this happens. You either have your claim accepted. So you, as most of our audience, you're an insurance carrier, you're an employer, 
you say, you know what? I saw Bob get injured. I know he's a, he's an honest guy. I have video of him getting injured. I'm going to pick up this claim. I'm going to accept this claim as compensable. You're going to go file all the forms that we talked about in our first session, and which are all those sessions are available on the Chartwell website, by the way. If you don't want to do that, if there's no recording of the injury, you have suspicions about the injury, the injury was never actually reported to you, the other venue in which we commonly come about compensable claims is through the filing of a claim petition. The claimant files a petition asking the judge to determine that they have a compensable work injury. So that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about claim petitions, what has to be proven in the litigation of the claim petition, and what are we, and when I say we, I mean Pennsylvania employers and insurers, what are we looking to for defenses to claim petitions? So first, very simple question I have, and I, I guess I'll direct it to Mike very quickly. Mike, when we're, when we're litigating a claim petition, burden of proof is with whom? The claimant has the burden of proof to prove all the elements of the claim petition, and if they don't, they'll be unsuccessful before the workers' compensation judge. Which is important, and I think it's especially important when Mike says all elements, because there will sometimes be situations where the claimant fails to present evidence as to one element that they might have assumed was, was you know, part of their evidence and they forgot about it, and that could be yes. a fatal flaw for, for a claimant or a claimant's attorney. So what we're going to talk about with these elements, and I want to go over them just as a, a pointer. I'll go through the points, and then we're going to break them down specifically. We're going to talk about jurisdiction. We're going to talk about proving that the employment relationship exists between the claimant, the employee, and the employer. We're going to talk about notice, giving notice of an injury. We're going to talk about causally related disability, proving causally related disability, and we're going to talk about course and scope. Those are all elements of the claim petition that the claimant has to prove with their evidence before the judge. So, Alex, let's start out on the most exciting one, jurisdiction. What, what are we talking about when we say jurisdiction, and, and what does a claimant in Pennsylvania have to prove uh, to, to clear that hurdle initially? You know, it might not be the most uh, exciting, but it's first, and it's first for a reason. So an element of, to have a compensable work, uh, Pennsylvania workers' compensation claim, you need to find out if the injury was in Pennsylvania or if Pennsylvania has jurisdiction over the claim. And by jurisdiction, I mean, does the state have the authority to make decisions and judgments on the work injury in the claim. So you're asking what injuries come within the jurisdiction of Pennsylvania. Most obviously is that um, it's all injuries occurring inside of the state. Um, and this does not matter where the contract of hire was made. And this is also irrespective of say an employment contract stating that um, jurisdiction for their work injury would be in a different state. Um, the most relatable, perhaps, um, a, a sample of that is that if you were on, say you're on a cruise ship, if you look at your ticket on the fine print, it says if there's a lawsuit or any action that you would like to file, there's a venue attached to your um, cruise. So you can't just file it in your home state. You have to go to their venue. That type of jurisdiction venue would be void um, in Pennsylvania employment um, for a Pennsylvania work injury. Um, so other Alex, than just injuries to, occurring. Just to jump in with a question there. I start a new business. I, I've, I've become belabored with the practice of law. I want to open a bagel shop in Pennsylvania. And we're, we're right on the border with New Jersey. And, and I've heard some of my clients like our Pennsylvania workers compensation jurisdiction less than New Jersey. Some feel otherwise. But I think I'm smart, so I'm going to have my my uh, bagel sellers. They're all going to sign a contract that says, you know what, I'm never going to get injured, but if I ever do, I, I'm a Jersey claimant. That, that you're saying that won't fly. Correct. That that will not fly. Um, and so so say you did own that bagel shop and you had stores in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania, you might have some crossover with your employees as well. Um, there's different fact patterns other than the injury just occurring in um, Pennsylvania, where Pennsylvania will still have jurisdiction over the work 
injury claim. Uh, one of them explain, being. Explain. Yeah, can if, you explain that? Because because how would if the it seems like what you're saying is if the injury occurs physically in Pennsylvania, it's a Pennsylvania claim. Okay. If the injury doesn't occur in Pennsylvania, why would why would it be a Pennsylvania claim? How how would that shake out? Sure. Um, there's a few type of. of factors that you would have to, this, this will be very fact-based and it would depend on a good initial in investigation to determine it. One of the most important ones is that the employment needs to be quote, principally located in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, one, one other one, if, if your job say it wasn't principally localized in Pennsylvania, if your contract for hire that you were working under was made in Pennsylvania, then that will be a Pennsylvania workers compensation claim. One of the most frequent uh, examples of this would be uh, an overnight or a long haul trucker signs his contract for hire in Pennsylvania. Um, his place where he reports at the end of every day and the start of each day is in Pennsylvania. He gets in and he injures his back unloading cargo and Maryland. That would, based on that fact pattern, that would be a Pennsylvania workers' compensation claim. Anything else on jurisdiction that you think that our clients might see frequently or that, that you'd like to point out before we, we move on to the next element of the claim petition? J Jason, uh, just one point I'd like to make is that when we have employers functioning near the borders of Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, you need to look to see if they qualify in more than one jurisdiction because we've had instances where the claim in New Jersey will be settled and then the claimant will turn around and file a Pennsylvania claim. And although you have a credit for any payments made in the New Jersey part of the case, uh, the Pennsylvania law is uh, much more favorable to claimants in, in several instances and uh, you'd want to, if you're going to settle a case, settle both jurisdictions so that you extinguish that case completely. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think that what you're, you're also hitting on there is, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, settling, if, it, if it's an Ohio, Pennsylvania case, settling the Ohio case without settling the Pennsylvania case, while you might get a credit, does not exhaust your Pennsylvania exposure. Is that exactly. Correct? Exactly. And we've had a few of those cases and, uh, uh, the Pennsylvania system, like I said, as we as we believe, is much more favorable to claimants, and it's sometimes more difficult to terminate the claimants in Pennsylvania than it is in other jurisdictions. Yeah, and and Alex, I don't know if you've experienced this, but occasionally, and it's it, I guess this will be more for our insurance carriers that are in the presentation, uh, we'll encounter issues where the coverage is for a particular state. The the employer might get coverage in New Jersey, all their coverage is in New Jersey but they actually have a Pennsylvania injury and that can, that can be a, a sticky situation because then you have an employer who's denying coverage for the, the, uh, the neighboring state when there might actually be a claim there. And, and it's, it's something just to be aware of, I think both when you're as an employer getting your coverage and when you're looking at these claims from the insurance carrier side. Anything else, Alex or Mike on, on uh, jurisdiction specifically? No, we're good. Just real, just really quick, uh, Jason. What you just talked about the employer lacking coverage. I think the case on point of, of that is um, Robert Neff Incorporated um, versus the Workers' Compensation Appeal Board. And Mike touched on it as well. Um, just so ever, it's un, our act says that it's unlawful for a claimant to receive benefits um, in Pennsylvania simultaneously with a another state or with the or with the federal or federal benefits um, for the same work injury. So that's important to note as well. I do see that we had a question about in general, uh, general approach to COVID claims uh, with respect to burden of proof. I think we'll touch on that as we go on. I think that's going to get get more to causal ca proving causal relation. So I want to I, I note your question. It's a good one and, and we'll be certain to get to it. So moving beyond the exciting world of jurisdiction, uh, let's talk about notice. Uh, notice, Mike, is something that in, in, I would say a majority of my claims is not an issue, but when it is an issue, it's a big issue. Can you, can you tell people what we're looking at 
when we're when we're from the defense side arguing that notice wasn't proper and really what's the standard for providing notice from the claim well the claimants required to provide notice to the employer in section 311 312 313 and the statute requires that the claimant provide notice in the quotes ordinary language that they were injured in the course of their employment on or about a specific time at or near a specific place and when i read that statute i don't think i have many cases where notice is provided with that sufficient detail but uh, we don't see many cases denied on the basis of notice often the the circumstances will dictate that the employer actually had knowledge of the injury there were witnesses or it was on the facility at the premises so there's really not an issue as to the employer being notified of the existence of an injury uh, one of the uh, cases tells us that where the injury is obvious uh, to the employer notice specific notice is not required uh, in the occupation of disease types of claims we had the discovery rule rule where the injured worker does not need to provide notice to the employer of the cause or relationship of their condition until they knew or should have known and typically that date of knowing for that occupation of disease claimant corresponds to the date when their doctor tells them that their disease is related to their employment so uh that 21 day uh, notice requirement corresponds to the 21 days of accepting or denying a claim. So there's some uh, synergy there in the Workers' Compensation Act. And Alex, could you, as far as what constitutes proof of notice, uh, do you have to have a, a certified letter? Do you have to take a, a selfie video of yourself telling your supervisor? What are we talking about when we're trying to prove that notice was given of a work injury and we're arguing about it before a work comp judge? So one thing that is, I think, forgotten sometimes is that it's still the claimant's burden to prove that the employer had received of their notice. Um, obviously, there are situations which make sense that if the injury is obvious, um, notice isn't required. Um, the most, one of the most um, general um, examples of that would be if a worker fell off a ladder and broke his ankle right in front of his foreman or his boss. Um, that would count as notice. Um, otherwise, proving notice um, is through the filing of, uh, is reporting to a supervisor, documenting that, and then filling out either a work injury report. But you need to confirm that your supervisor has received the notice. So there's case law um, on the saying, a claimant reporting that he mailed uh, the his boss a letter saying he was injured after he had already abandoned uh, the job is not sufficient notice. Um, slipping an injury report under a manager's door is not sufficient notice. Um, this is uh, as our adjusters and uh, claims that claims and bins know. Work, Pennsylvania workers comp is very fact heavy, fact induced. Proof of notice is no different. It's uh, type of a totality of the circumstances test. The judge will listen to the claimant, hear the facts, hear opposing testimony, perhaps, and determine if notice was given and if notice was proper. So just a, a, a point there. I think Mike might have mentioned, and you can correct me, Alex, uh, I just asked the dumb questions. Uh, 120 days is the time frame in which the claimant has to give notice of some sort that a work in, they believe a work injury occurred. Is that, that that's accurate? Correct. And then once that happens, the employer has 21 days to either accept the claim, deny the claims, respond in some way. Is that what the 21 days is? That's the 21 day rule. Yes. What happens if, if I have a work injury, I tell my supervisor, you know, maybe I quit a week later. So I've given notice. Nobody disputes that I've given notice. I quit a week later, I go to a different job. And then, you know, six months later, eight months later, my knee starts to hurt. And I think it's because of that work injury that I already reported. How long do I have to file a claim petition? Is that also governed by the 120 days or do I have a longer time frame? Well, it's three years, but that three years can be a little touchy. So you have um, the general rule is that you have three years to file the claim petition from the date of the injury. However, of course, there's always how, how evers, right? Um, the Zimmerman case 
states that that is the date of the disability, not at the date of the injury. And so that's an important thing to note, I think. And we actually just got a, a, a timely question from Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Uh, cumulative injuries. So it's a re repetitive use injury. I, I've been typing, typing, typing at my, my Chartwell seminars, and I develop, you know, wrist injuries from that. For a cumulative injury, what, what's my date? What's my date that I have to provide notice? When does that time start ticking? So that notice also depends. Um, the, it's also the trauma or the date of the injury is often found to be the last day of work, which can then delay the 120 day notice period. Um, however, the, uh, the date of the, the diagnosis, not the last day of work will be used to start the clock. So um, that would be important if there's evidence that does not support um, finding of a continuing aggravation. Um, Sure. And that's where I think in our experience, we'll see a claimant testify, you know, when I stopped working, I knew that, you know, I knew my hands were sore, but I didn't actually get around to seeing my, my upper extremity specialist until three months later. And it wasn't until I had been seeing him for three months that he finally told me, you know what, I, I think your, your carpal tunnel condition is actually related to your work that you stopped working at, you know, eight months ago. So I, I think in, in practice, that's how we see that get strung out a little bit. Uh, they're rare and, and terrible when we see them, but what about a fatal claim? What about a, a death situation? Is it the same three years or, or, or are the numbers changed at all? So it kind of does change. So the filing of a fatal claim must be done within three years after the death of a claimant, but the death must also occur 300 weeks after the date of the injury. Um, and the law is also a little different for firefighter cancer claims, fatal firefighter cancer claims. They have 600 weeks to file um, after the date of the injury. So that means that I suffered the work injury on date certain. I, I suffer it in 2013. And because of, you know, her horrible circumstances and, and worsening a condition, I pass away. 302 weeks later from that date certain that's too late it, 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 is that am i sol for lack of a better term or is there a different standard there now i was told there was not going to be any math here but <laughs> um now the, the the rule is that the death must occur uh within 300 weeks after the date of the injury um okay. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, case we don't see that. Actually, Go ahead. I was going to say, the case law is, um, those cases are always super fact-specific and involve a lot of medical testimony and record reviews because that general rule is in place to account for other issues that claimants run across that are non-work re related, other, other health issues. Yeah, it's tough. It's a, it, death claims are always horrible, no matter how, no matter the outcome. Mike, anything you think we missed on notice? Well, just that technically in a death case, no notice is required. You just need to file your petition within the time frames we've mentioned. Okay. I want to circle back around. I skipped a, an entry on our outline. Uh, magically, our, our guests don't know because they don't have the outline in front of them. Uh, you do have to prove that you're an, an employee. You have to prove an employment relationship with your Pennsylvania employer to have a compensable Pennsylvania workers' comp claim. Uh, Mike, when are the situations where that is often contested? What, you know, what's the standard there and where do we see that most often become a, a contested issue? Well, the standard is that we typically envision the employer being the individual who has the right to hire or fire the worker. They also have the right to control the details of their employment. And this typically arises in the construction industry and sometimes in the trucking industry because uh, back in the day in the 70s and 80s, they would have these arrangements where they would have a trip lease where the uh, employer would lease the truck to the employee. They would call them an independent contractor and put in the contract, oh yeah, the state of Iowa controls. So those types of contracts were thrown out both in the requirement of the jurisdiction and also the facade that 
you are self-employed. I lease you a truck that I own, you're self-employed, but I tell you where to go. I tell you when you can pick up. I tell you, you can't pick up any loads for any other employers. So basically you're exercising control over the daily tasks that the person performs. Uh, as I said, one of the areas that we see this frequently arise is with contractors, that the contractor will hire an individual who is capable of performing, say, plastering or electrical work or plumbing. Now, if that person is directed by the employer in the manner of what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, they're typically going to be considered an employee. The instance where we see that, that subcontractor, that, that tradesmen, the electrician, the plumber, where we see they become a not an employee but an independent contractor is where they have their own business that exists separate and apart from the purported employer. There's a contract between the employer and the subcontractor and that the contractor is giving over that task to this individual. So where the individual is working without supervision, they have their own tools, they have their own separate business, that's going to be considered more of an independent contractor. Where you're hiring an individual, telling them they have to wear this uniform, telling them where to go in the morning, telling them what time to work, when to stop working, or what types of tasks you perform, those situations where you're controlling the details of the workday, you're gonna be considered the employer. Uh, there's a case just recently in May called Berkebal Towing, which is a great case if you have a towing case because the court went into excruciating detail about why this individual was not an independent contractor, even though he was paid uh, by, by the tow, even though he had some aspects of an, an independent contractor in, in his daily life, he did not work anywhere else. He was using a truck owned by the employer. The employer dispatched him with their dispatcher and they uh, basically controlled every detail of his performance. So in that situation where there was a fatal claim, the individual was held to be an employee of the trucking company. Mike, what's the difference between, and, and as a seasoned attorney, I always mix these words up anyways, uh, independent contractor case law, whether someone's an independent contractor, and statutory employer rule, which also confusingly also uses the word contractor a lot. How statutory right. employer apply? Well, well, those two concepts can overlap. And, and when we're talking about the construction cases, they, they in fact do overlap to some degree. Uh, one of the early appellate court decisions said that the characteristic of an independent contractor relationship is that the person engaged in the work has exclusive control of the manner that they perform the work and they're responsible only for the result. And by analogy, you can think of the person that you hire to come to your home to do a plumbing job. I don't know how to perform any plumbing tasks, so I can't supervise this individual. He has to be an independent contractor because he has the knowledge when he comes on the site to perform the work, and he's only responsible to me for the job well done. Now, the statutory employer concept arises in the construction business where there's a business, we'll call them the statutory employer, who has ownership or control over the land. They also have a contract to perform work on that land, and then they have a subcontract with another company or individual. If that company, the subcontractor, is not insured for workers' compensation purposes, and if the employee of the subcontractor is injured, then that general contractor who hired the sub is going to be responsible and their worker compensation insurer is going to be responsible for the injury to the uninsured subcontractor. Why? Well, because as a general contractor, you're supposed to be sure and assure that your subcontractors are insured for workers compensation purposes. And if you neglect to do that, then the liability is going to come back to you. So uh, it's, there's specific criteria regarding the statutory employer concept. And again, it creates liability where there ordinarily would not be a liability if that subcontractor had been properly insured. The Construction Workplace Misclassification Act, that's, you know, for, for those of us who've been doing it a while, that's newer. Uh, how does that play into determining whether someone is an independent contractor or not? Well, the, the, the act was effective in February 2011, and it was an attempt to try to clean up some of the misdeeds that were going on in the construction business with subcontractors and contractors. And it 
defines certain terms. The act says that an independent contractor must have all three of these items. The individual has a written contract to perform services. The individual is free from control or direction of the performance of their services. And the individual customarily is engaged in an independent established trade, occupation, profession, or business. And then the act further defines what that means to have an independent established trade, occupation, or profession or business. So the, the act became very specific to say, no, you can't try to make your subcontractors uh, or your, your employees into subcontractors. There's some definite criteria now and eliminate a lot of the, the fuzzy areas and, and uh, un, unclear points of the prior case law. So now since 2011, if you don't meet these criteria, you're not an independent contractor. And if you take a step back, the issue of who's the employer and who's the employee becomes relevant when there's civil liability, because we see in instances where there's a construction injury, the general contractor wants to be the employer for workers' compensation purposes, because then they do not have civil liability for pain and suffering, loss of consortium, in addition to wage loss and medical expense. So it's what we call the shield protection of the Workers' Compensation Act where conversely the injured worker would rather be in that instance, an independent contractor and have a, a civil action liability against that purported employer. So we see that going back and forth uh, in workers comp cases and also in, in civil actions as to who is properly considered an employer, who is properly considered an employee. Yeah, and just to give my, my own input, I think that from our, from our participants perspective, there's probably a subset of the people that are watching right now that are never going to see these independent contractor statutory employer cases at all and then there's a couple people that most of their claims have some sort of tinge to that so it it can be very industry specific but it might pop up in what you wouldn't think would be the normal situation and especially with independent contractor it's not just a construction thing it could be you know somebody who's delivering something or or, or it could be a teacher it could be a per diem type situation uh the thing that i see here a lot when i speak to my clients and the employers uh is it's in it's in our, it's in my employment contract I, I had this well it's not an employment contract don't use that word it's in my contract with this independent contractor they ver they agree in the text that i'm an independent contractor and i think what mike's getting at is that's a factor for the comp judge to consider but they're going to look at the workplace uh, construction workplace misclassification act in the right setting they're going to look at the testimony they're going to look at all the other factors just because you have that in writing doesn't mean, from my perspective, Mike, that you're going to be held to that. That's right. And I think the court is, and the workers' compensation judge is going to look to the actual facts of what is actually going on on a day-to-day -day basis, not what the contract says. The contract may, may say something in terms of that you are an independent contractor, but then the actual facts are the purported employer is controlling every detail of the individual's workday. Uh, they're not going to be considered an independent contractor in that circumstance. Alex, anything you think we missed on, on um, proving the existence of the employment relationship? Well, I just want to touch on what you just mentioned. You know, just because a uh, contract drawn up between two people says you will be an independent contractor, um, that, you know, you were saying that doesn't mean that they're an independent contractor. That's kind of a general theme in Pennsylvania workers' compensation. As you know, as I mentioned in um, the jurisdiction portion, if you draw up in your contract, this jurisdiction for your work injury is in state, uh, is in the state of Tennessee, not Pennsylvania, the courts have said that that's, that doesn't matter. That's not, um, you know, that portion of the contract will, will be void. So you can kind of see that general theme in the Pennsylvania Workers' Compensation Act and how our courts have ruled um, based upon that. Yeah, absolutely. Judges have, in my view, great discretion to interpret and in some cases disregard uh, contracts between parties, workers' comp judges. Uh, so we've talked about jurisdiction. You have to have Pennsylvania jurisdiction. You have to prove that an employment relationship exists. Again, this is the claimant that has to prove all of this. You have to prove that proper notice was given. And then I think really what, what is, is the, the keystone, uh, no pun intended for Pennsylvania comp claims, is you have to prove causally related disability. And this gets to, I don't want to go too far down the COVID path, but it gets to the question that was asked about COVID claims. I think that that's a big sticking point for COVID claims is proving causally related disability. 
Mike, can you start out with the standard? What is needed to prove causally related disability and then go through, you know, how the courts have addressed that standard? Right. We're, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania started off in uh, the Morgan versus Giant Markets case back in 1979, saying that where an injury is obvious, you don't even need to present medical evidence. Uh, the times in my practice where I see claimants not pre presenting medical evidence is because they don't have it. There's a physician who will not make the causal relationship, and they're going to try to make the argument that the work injury is obvious. And that Giant Markets case, the, the Morgan case, I, I went back to see this. I've read about this case for years, and I went back to see what exactly happened. And it was a bakery delivery driver pushing a stack of bins in the back of the truck. And I, they couldn't get any medical evidence from the treating doctors. And the court said, well, you don't need it. That's pretty obvious that you had uh, the person performing an act that requires force or strain. Pain is experienced at the port, point of force or strain. And injury can be found to be established because of those events. And the court said, my, my favorite quote, pain is an excellent symptom of injury. And we've heard that often, and uh, the court relied upon that to say, well, where the conditions obvious, you do not need medical evidence. But in all those other cases where the causal relationship is not obvious, you need to present unequivocal medical evidence that draws a causal relationship between the work event and the condition that's diagnosed. And also the injured worker needs to prove disability, which is wrapped into that medical opinion. So in, in most of the cases, we see that the claimants do not have difficulty proving a causal relationship. Where we see in instances arise are in those cases where the claimant has a pre-existing condition and perhaps they have not disclosed it fully to the treating doctor. In those circumstances, we see opinions from treating physicians that may not be legally competent. And why? Well, it's because they're not testifying, they're not providing an opinion based upon all the facts. If the doctor testifies that your low back injury is related to your lifting at work because you've never had a low back injury before. And if we present and, and document evidence of prior multiple low back injuries, well then that medical opinion may not be legally competent to support an award of disability benefits. So we look to the medical records and that's why we often request all the records to determine, is there any history that would break the causal relationship between the work event and the diagnosed condition such that there's a pre-existing condition or non-occupational condition that's responsible for their medical condition and also their disability. Mike, I think uh, I bring this up with my clients sometimes and it's usually having a, a tough conversation, but on occasion we'll have a medical expert testify and if it's claimant's medical expert, this could be a good thing. If it's our own medical expert, it could be very problematic and the concern is that they have uh, equivocated, which is an important term of art. And, and, and I'll use that sometimes with my clients and then I'll try to provide an explanation. But what are we talking about when we, we say a doctor, a medical expert has equivocated, they're being equivocal, and why is it so significant to the outcome of the claim? Well, again, we have a specific Supreme Court decision that clarifies the exact language for us, the Lewis case from 1985. And it says where the causal relationship of injury not, is not obvious, medical evidence is necessary to establish the causal relationship. And that medical witness must testify that the injury or condition was a result of the assigned cause, not that it came from or it was conceivable or possible or might have been or anything that reflects equivocation is not going to be a competent medical opinion to draw the causal relationship. Uh, we sometimes hear doctors testify and in the course of the deposition will say, well, I think this is what happened. The words I think the court has recognized, that's just the way people speak sometimes. That doesn't mean you're equivocating when you use the word I think. But when you're saying it's possible, it's conceivable, it could have happened, it might have happened, those are words of equivocation. And those opinions are not going to be legally sufficient to support a finding of causation or a finding of disability. Yeah, and I think for our for our clients uh, and for those on the on the conference, 
you can get into that on occasion when you have either multiple body parts or different injuries involved with one claim. So you have a, a neurological component and you have a lower back injury and your ortho is testifying about the lower back injury. They're asked about the concussion, either on direct or cross-examination. And they give some of the responses that, that Mike's talking about, trying to be honest, saying, well, it, from what I know about concussions, that's probably not the case. It probably wouldn't be work-related. I think you need to be very careful there on the defense side. It might be a situation where you need to bring in another medical expert to shore up that testimony because you need to have somebody testify unequivocally that that, that specific body part, that alleged injury is not work-related. Uh, anything else on causal relatedness? And, and I think, I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on COVID, but it's, it's obviously a source of uh, friction and the question was posed as, is it safer to deny a COVID claim? A uh, very logical question. I'm interested in your thoughts, Mike. I think you could probably mount a defense to a COVID claim in, in generally, unless there's an assumption, unless there's a, a, a statutory assumption uh, in your state that says, you know, anybody who's a police officer has an assumption of work-relatedness if they get COVID, whatever the case may be. Uh, outside of that context, I think you could probably mount a defense that somebody could get COVID anywhere other than the workplace and they just, there's no way to prove they got it in the workplace. I think it's more of a judgment call uh, based on your workforce. You know, what kind of employees do you have? Is it gonna be a really bad look if you're forcing people to come in during a dangerous time and you know, they get COVID and you're seen as somebody who's not compensating for that. And also an exposure issue because fortunately a lot of people get it and recover quickly. So for my clients, I've seen a lot of them just decide you know, we're going to pick up these claims for the most part. And if it's really questionable or if there's a concern that it's going to be a huge exposure, then we'll take a closer look. Uh, but what are your thoughts specifically, Mike, with regard to proving causal relatedness in, in a COVID claim? Whenever we have these new conditions or new diseases arise, I always go back to my general analysis and go through the steps of what is a compensable claim? What are the essential elements of a compensable claim? Now, prior to COVID, we had healthcare professionals working in hospitals getting viruses, getting hepatitis, getting infections. And we go through the causal relationship analysis in those cases, just as we do in COVID cases. And I think the, the thought process is that perhaps it's easier to deny a case because number one, the claimant has the burden of proof. And number two, with a, a condition such as COVID that was so easily transmittable, we have a plausible argument that, well, maybe it didn't happen at work. Let's do our contact tracing. Is anyone in the workplace, does anyone else have COVID concurrently with this individual? That, that tends to, to an argument that if there's no other individuals sick at your place of employment, then perhaps the employee picked it up outside the place of employment. So I think you can do that analysis of you looking at the cause of relationship looking to see if there's any documentation. And again, the claimant has the burden of proof. So I think if you deny a case, you uh, would not likely obtain an unreasonable contest assessment of fees because you have a legitimate right to compel the claimant to prove their case. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. There was a question from, uh, from Ann. Hi, Ann, about the status of presumptions in Pennsylvania. Uh, I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't <laughs> followed the legislation closely lately. Uh, I know that, you know, a year ago, 12 months ago, there was a lot of talk about, you know, an expansive presumption law for anybody considered essential employees. Obviously that didn't happen. Right. Uh, I would think at this stage, just, you know, spitballing my own thoughts, it would be unlikely. And I think the biggest issue would be, is it going to be retroactive? Uh, right. Because you, you're going to have to look back at these claims that have happened since March of 2020. So, right. uh, as to the likelihood asking, you know, Joe Schmo, Jason, I think it's unlikely at this stage, but if we've learned anything in the last 18 months, it's a, it's a, this has been completely unpredictable. So uh, we'll see. I know other states have enacted stronger presumptions affecting more workers. Uh, Pennsylvania hasn't gotten there yet. Right. Both the Senate bill and the house bill never made it at a committee to be voted on and, and signed by the governor. So uh, like you said, unless it's retroactive, uh, we, we don't have a current presumption in Pennsylvania. Yeah, and I think some of that might have been from our clients willingly picking up claims uh, in a lot of instances. I think if you had across the board, every employer in Pennsylvania denying every COVID claim, you would have seen a little bit more action on that. Uh, Alex, you're still with us? 
<laughs> yes, I'm here. Can everyone, can you still see me? I didn't know if you were out there with the trees, sh sharpening your, your ax. Uh, <laughs> we got through the, 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 the initial four uh, standards. So you have your claim petition granted. We talked about jurisdiction. We talked about proving the employment relationship. We talked about giving proper notice and we just talked about proving causally related disability. Uh, the last one, you can do all of that as a claimant, which seems substantial, and you can still fail. Uh, and you can fail because your injury is not within the course and scope. And I will note for everybody, and I'm sure you've already watched the video many times, but we did do course and scope about two months ago. We spent a whole hour on it. But I think it's important in this context, Alex, just to recap, what, what is the significance of course and scope and how can that be a, a hurdle for a claimant? Right, and I can still feel the palpable buzz from some of the people attending now <laughs> from that last uh, webinar. But oh, yeah. just right. to just briefly, just to briefly go about course and scope. So, the injured worker must be furthering the business interests of the employer. That's kind of the general rule here, and um, what that means is you can't be doing a personal detour or or um, a departure from your work. But that does not um, that doesn't really include a very brief inter, inter, interruption in your work re, re relationship. Say you are um, during your work, you're going, uh, you're traveling from point A to point B, um, and you stop to get gas because you have to get gas. You're still furthering the business interests of your employer. But of course, one of the caveats here is there's still the coming and going rule, which is commuting to and from work, you're not seen in the course and scope of your employment at, the, at that time. Once you get to once you get to your work's parking lot, in, in general, you are deemed to be within the course and scope of employment. And then one kind of fun caveat here, um, fun is relative, I guess, is that there's the good Samaritan rule, which if an employee goes to the aid of someone in any emergency, which, which would not be in the course and scope of their employment, that will still be deemed to be within the course and scope of their employment because they, I think it's a public policy rule that people, um, you know, the state wants to encourage good Samaritans when they can and not punish them for it. Yeah, I mean, you're not gonna see that in a lot of claims, but if you do, uh, I would not want to go in front of many workers' compensation judges in Pennsylvania uh, denying the claim of the hero Good Samaritan because the, <laughs> I didn't tell them I didn't tell them to go save their coworker's life. And I think I think everybody on the on the call would probably understand and agree with that. Uh, a question about the prior presentations that somebody felt the buzz, Alex. They they are available on our website. If you go to the Chartwell website and click on, I believe. Uh, resource center at the bottom. There's a video library. You can also email me and, and I think the follow up email will have the links to the prior presentations. And we do have several more upcoming. So we do it about every two months and we'll keep adding those videos. We'll add the video from today. Uh, I don't want to run out of time. So let's talk about the situations where the employer can defend a claim petition because we can defend claim petitions. Uh, I think everybody knows that the, the most common defense to a claim petition is just making the claimant's doctor look like a fool and, and winning on cross-examination. And, and Mike does that in every claim, and it's happened to me once. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's, it, that's how we usually defend claim petitions. Our doctor's better than yours. Uh, frankly, the claimant's credibility is probably the biggest determination. If you can get the judge to dislike the claimant and disbelieve the claimant, that's how you're going to win a claim petition. But there are uh, pursuant to the Workers Compensation Act and the case law, there are certain defenses that you can raise where, you know, credibility might be irrespective of credi credibility or medical evidence, you can still win. So these are rare. You're not going to see them all the time, but they're also, you know, low hanging fruit. If you can prove one of these, you might avoid having to prove the other stuff. You might avoid having to overcome the medical evidence from the claimant if you can prove one of the affirmative defenses. Uh, the first one we have, Mike, is violation of law, intoxication. What are, what are we talking about there and, and how is it presented to the judge? Well, this is an affirmative defense to the claim. This is where the claimant's 
met their burden of proof. They've proven notice. They've proven their employee. They've proved they're within the scope of their employment. they proved their disability or causal relationship by medical evidence. And even in all circumstances where all those elements are met, the employer has an affirmative defense if the individual has violated the law. And uh, this is under Section 301A of the Act. It's an affirmative defense to work-related disability claim. The employer is liable for compensation for injury in the course of the employment, provided that no compensation shall be paid when the injury or death is intentionally self-inflicted or caused by violation of law, including but not limited to illegal use of drugs. And that it's important to note that illegal use of drugs can be illegal use of prescription drugs. It's not necessarily street drugs. So the burden of proof is upon the employer to establish entitlement to this affirmative defense. And that can sometimes be difficult. Uh, typically, uh, we need to present a medical expert to document that the intoxication occurred. And furthermore, that the intoxication was the cause of the accident. There's a case from years ago, I think it's the 1970s, an Abbott Dairies case. The milk truck driver had a blood alcohol over 0.1. I think it was closer to 0.2. But the accident occurred because the front axle on the milk truck broke. So whether he was intoxicated or not did not cause the accident. In that instance, the fatal claim, the benefits were awarded to the individual because his intoxication was not the direct result of his disability and death. So the employer has the burden of proof. Uh, what we do is we typically will obtain the medical records to determine if there's a blood alcohol taken at the time of the injury. Uh, one of the questions that you posed in the materials to me earlier, Jason, was whether or not you need a violation of law, whether or not you need uh, a court proceeding. And the case law is, is clear. You do not, but you still need to improve that causal relationship. In fact, there was one case I found where the uh, employer lost because they relied simply upon the police report and the blood alcohol study. And the court, the Commonwealth Court on, on, on appeal uh, reversed the denial of benefits and said, this person's entitled to benefits. Why? Well, this is hearsay evidence. The reporting officer was not a witness to the event. So basically you have hearsay, it's an official record, but it contains hearsay. That's not sufficient to support your affirmative defense. So even though they had a police report, they did not prevail. What we typically do in these cases is we retain a toxicologist or a medical expert to draw the causal relationship between having that level of blood alcohol and the impairment it causes in your body. Uh, if there's a case that the Mahan case that talks about a window washer falling from a ladder, well, what the employer did there is his blood alcohol was over 0.1. It was actually 0.238, which is pretty good drinking. And the employer brought in the medical witness to say, well, how do you draw the causal relationship between drinking and falling off a ladder? Well, drinking decreases your visual acuity, it decreases your balance, it decreases your good judgment. So the medical opinion was accepted by the workers' compensation judge that the drinking was the cause of the fall, therefore the person was not entitled to any benefits. Yeah, I think that was a good overview. I think the pretty good drinking is all relative it's good for, <laughs> good for a saturday night but perhaps not once you get to the top of the ladder uh and i think what mike kind of implies there and he, and he touches on is that sometimes these cases look like slam dunks you know you you know in, in the case he mentioned they had the police report uh you just have to be very careful some of the hardest claims to win are sometimes the ones that you think you're going to win the easiest you just want to make sure that you get all that evidence in before the judge and give them no other reason but your affirmative defense to deny the claim petition, because it could be a situation of, as we've already discussed, where the claimant's proven all of their elements to meet the burden of the claim petition. So if all you have is this affirmative defense, you wanna be very careful with it. Uh, getting away from uh, statewide laws and, and, legal, and criminal laws, Alex, what do we have when we talk about the employer's laws, the positive work order? How, how does that apply to an affirmative defense? Right, so a violation of a positive work order can also negate a claim here. And just as we've been mentioning, you know, the claimant's proven they're, they're part of the claim petition. Now it's the employer's turn to prove their part of um, the defense. So it is an affirmative defense. It's our burden of proof. Um, there's three steps to prove a violation of a positive work order. One, 
the injury was caused by a violation of the order or the rule. Uh, two, the claimant was actually aware of the order and the rule. And three, that uh, the order implicated an event that was not in connection with that claimant's work injuries or duties. Um, the best way I think to show this is to give a few brief uh, examples. Um, one uh, is a case where a trucker, long haul trucker, was repairing a flat tire on his truck and injured his back. But he knew that the employer had specific rules and orders not to repair flat tires as they had a service crew that would do that job. That was deemed to be um, a violation of a positive work order that the um, claimant was, a, was aware about. So it was not deemed to be compensable. Um, one other one that is, is kind of more often would be uh, doing a joyride on a forklift and you, and you, have, a, and you have a work injury. That would obviously be a violation of a positive work order. Yeah, and I think I don't think we have time to get into it, but one place where you might see this is, is going to get, and we are taking no position whatsoever on the issue, but it's going to be in vaccine requirements. So an employer is requiring a, a vaccine requirement. The employee does not get vaccinated. They come to work. They develop COVID, assuming they can prove it's work related. Is that violation of positive work order? I haven't gotten that claim. I I, I hope none of our people get those either but I could see it being somewhere where the litigation goes on positive work orders. Uh, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, there's not a standard out there for how the work order is communicated. Can it be a verbal uh, instruction that's given to everybody and you have coworkers who can testify? Yes, Supervisor Bob told us every day, you know, don't do pull-ups on, on the jigsaw machine. Uh, or does it have to be written in a contract and something that you can present to the judge in written form? Oh, I think um, more and more often you'll see that these rules and orders are verbal. Um, you know, obviously violation of the positive work orders and the injuries, things like the forklift or the truck happen um, in construction or um, areas where you're not in an office. So lots of times everyone's dealt with the employer or the fact witness who testifies that once a month or once a week, we go over safety. We sit down for an hour and speak about safety, the rules and procedures that we go through to advise our workers about, you know, the proper techniques, proper lifting, proper uh, protocols, proper gear to use. So I think that would be more than so to establish that the claimant was aware of the order or the rule. So it's another factual finding that's, that's going to be left to the judge. So you want to make sure you present good evidence on that. Uh, Mike, I, personal animosity. I don't have any toward you, but if, if somebody does have a work injury, that's uh, they have an injury at the workplace caused by another individual. Uh, I don't want to call it anything. They have an injury that takes place in the workplace. Uh, why would it matter if someone has personal animosity? How is that playing into our affirmative defense or our defense to a claim petition. Yeah, this is an exception to the general rule that if you're injured at the workplace, it's going to be a work-related injury. Uh, there's several reported cases where coworkers have assaulted each other and uh, there's a dividing line. If the assault is for personal reasons that you had an affair with my wife, well, then that's not going to be a work-related disability. Sorry, Jason, I found out. Uh, <laughs> but if, for example, there's a case that I recall, uh, a plastics manufacturer where the person on the end of the line was responsible for shaving off the flash and sanding down the parts so that they were with the uh, customer specs. The guy at the other end running the molding machine was doing a slipshod job. So the person doing all the shaving and sanding was really busting their butt. And so he went up to the end of the machine and said, hey, buddy, you're, you're, you're killing me today. They got into an argument. It was over the topic of work. So that was a compensable work injury when the worker was punched by the coworker. So we draw that line as to whether or not the topic of the assault or altercation, whether it was work related in nature or something completely unrelated to the employment. Yeah, you're not gonna see those claims a lot, but inevitably they have fantastical fact patterns. And it, it's well, always- we're probably Go going. What we're probably going to see are employee assaults from enforcing masking mandates by their employer. 
And I think that's clear that if you are assaulted by a customer and you're enforcing the rules of your employer, that that is going to be work related uh, based upon those facts. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hadn't contemplated that, but I, unfortunately, uh, I could certainly imagine a scenario in which that arises. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned it earlier, Alex, I, I thought we might have touched on it, but when we were talking about the employment relationship, most likely undocumented workers. Uh, first question is the fact that someone's an undocumented worker an affirmative defense to a claim petition. Are you barred from workers compensation benefits in Pennsylvania because you're an undocumented worker. Uh, no, you will still be you are not ex excluded from being deemed an employee under the act if you're an undocumented worker. Um, however, the uh, the entitlement to benefits can change based on your work status or your medical status very differently from if you were uh, documented. For lack of and better. what we're talking about there is situation where it's an undocumented worker. It's now an adjudicated or accepted claim. The change is when the, the employer is trying to prove the ability to return to work, job availability, uh, ongoing earning capacity is, is that the is that the standard alex right so an undocumented after the after the work injury is established and you're deemed to be totally dis disabled you'll still you'll be entitled to benefits if you can prove all the elements that we've already been here uh, that we've already talked about here to today but once you're released to return to work in any type of capacity your benefits can be su suspended at that time and that's also um, kind of a public policy issue or way of thinking. Um, the reasoning behind that is that the cause, the cause of the undocumented workers' wage loss is the fact that they're undocumented now, not the, not the work injury. Right. Anything on, on uh, undocumented workers, Mike? Well, the, it's tough to prove because the undocumented worker can take the Fifth Amendment and not testify against them, their own interest. Uh, what I did in the case I had was that I got all the medical records and I actually went through every nursing note, which we, we, we usually don't go through the nursing notes, but in the nursing notes, the injured worker told the nurse that he was undocumented. He had come up from Columbia and he was injured working and he was uncertain as to what his status would be. So it was documented in a hospital record. The other types of discovery we did was to serve subpoenas on ICE and also Homeland Security in an attempt to get documentation from those sources that this individual was not here legally. So the converse would be true. He's not here legally. He's here illegally uh, or undocumented. And that would be supporting our argument that a return to any type of a release, medical release, any type of work would be sufficient for a suspension of benefits. Yeah, it can be a touchy subject. It can be difficult to prove, as Mike as Mike explained. Uh, the, the claim could take the fifth, and if you don't have some corollary evidence, you could be without strong evidence to prove the undocumented nature of the employment relationship. And you'll run into situations where the employers are, are not necessarily excited mm -hmm. to air that issue before a workers' compensation judge in a public forum. Uh, the last thing, uh, Mike, that we have that, that I think really plays into a couple of things we already talked about. I think it's it plays into the positive work order, it, and it also plays into course and scope. We're talking about things like abandonment of employment, personal activities, and and horseplay, which is where we get the, the funnest fact patterns. How are they raised as a defense to a claim petition? Well, again, the employer has the burden to prove these events happen, that uh, the individual abandoned their employment. And as uh, Alex mentioned earlier, Brief breaks for, for personal hygiene, things of that nature, are not going to be an abandonment of employment. Uh, the one case I've always referred to in seminars is the PESTA case where the man goes on his break collecting aluminum cans on the highway outside of the uh, employer's facility. He's struck by a car that's held to be a personal event. It's not related to the employment, even though it was an authorized break. So you're going to need to see a clear line drawn between the work-related activities and the activity that the person was conducting at the time. Uh, I think this whole wraps into the, the, the uh, course of employment, the violation of orders, 
and whether or not the person's in the scope of employment. Uh, my, my favorite illustration is the bowling ball case, uh, the Habib case from 2011, where the supervisor on a construction site, the, the workers find a bowling ball and they start deciding that it would be great to throw it around as a shot put. And after the employer tells them, the supervisor tells them not to do that, they decide, let's see how many strikes of a sledgehammer it takes to crack open a bowling ball. Again, the supervisor says, don't do that. The bowling ball is struck, a shard goes into the person's eye. They have the loss of use of the eye, but it's not compensable because this is a violation of the employer's rules. And it's also a, a horseplay, a frolic and detour. It has nothing to do with the work tasks or the, uh, the, the business of the employer. So that's going to be a, a non-compensable injury, unfortunately. So we're going to look and go back to our standard rules. How is this activity furthering the business or affairs of my employer? Or is it something strictly personal to my benefit? If so, then it's not going to be a compensable work-related injury, and the employer has the burden to prove those facts. Yeah, and I think it, it's we always want bright line rules in litigation of anything. And I think this is one of the areas where it, it's, it's going to be tough to find a bright line rule. It's, it's going to be up to your judge assignment. Sometimes it's going to be about the severity of the work injury. And, and, and a judge is going to say, you know, that, that, that guy was a good worker who just goofed around for five seconds. And now they're in this situation and they might have significant sympathies for, for the injured worker. So it, it can be a, a, a very fact sensitive subject area. And uh, it's another situation where I wouldn't want people to assume a win just because they first hear the fact pattern. You always want to you know, talk with counsel and go through the different factors. And sometimes it's a situation where maybe it's, it's easier to just do a, a small lump sum and pay off the claim instead of letting the judge determine that. I think we've covered both the standards for burden of proof for the claimant for the claim petition. I think we've covered the defenses that are out there uh, for the employers. Did you guys have anything that we missed that you wanted to catch up on? I think we've covered it all. Okay. And I think we also yeah, answered the question. Yeah. What's that, Alex? I was just going to say, I think we just did a great job. <laughs> you, you especially, you especially. Uh, I don't see any other outstanding questions. I didn't check the chat box, but there's nothing there. If you have any questions, something comes up, uh, shoot us an email. If you realize that we said something foolish uh, that's completely wrong, please let us know. Uh, we're always learning. So it, it's, it's always great having people come out for these. We'll be doing another one in two months, and we will send you too many emails that you don't want to read about that topic, and, and we encourage you to sign up and, and come back for more. Thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah, thanks.